morning and good afternoon to everyone joining today. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, after what has been an exciting week of programming here at Ask You, I'm extremely thankful for my colleagues assisting us here on this uh, meeting today uh, to facilitate this session for us, right? Um, I will introduce them all briefly and they will certainly share a lot more about themselves and the nature of the work they do in regard to the title of this session as we proceed. Uh, I am Jody Dixon, the Assistant Director of International Education at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, or ASCU, and I've had the pleasure of working on the Japan Studies Institute program with the program's director, Dr. Yoshiko Higurashi, for the last six years. This program is a joint initiative between ASCU and the San Diego State University and has been sustained for over 25 years due to a commitment to strengthening bilateral relations between the US and Japan, but also to uh, the commitment to providing an experience for faculty like yourselves, which will in essence allow you to complement your efforts to expand your students' global worldviews by incorporating elements of Japan into your curriculum. Additionally, um, today I'm joined by colleagues from the Laurasian Institution and a very interesting collaboration that developed by happenstance between myself and a fellow alum of the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program who now works with this organization. We were able to identify how well aligned our two organizations were for supporting the other to, full, to fulfill the goal of building capacity for campuses interested and invested in introducing or expanding Japanese teaching and learning in curricula or co-curricular activities in and around their campus communities. Today's session will be divided into two distinct but related segments. In part one, we will begin by introducing the Japan Studies Institute program. This segment will be facilitated by uh, Dr. Yoshiko Higurashi. She'll she will facilitate a conversation with Dr. Sandra gonzalez Dumond, who you heard was calling in. She's having a bit of um, technical difficulties, but hopefully we'll get her in here today. She is the professor of psychology at Ravapol College and Dr. Newly Paul, who is a professor of journalism at the University of North Texas. Um, please feel free to enter any questions you might have in the chat and we will respond to those questions prior to moving to the second segment. Part two of this session will be focused on the Japan Outreach Initiative, which is an amazing program for those interested in innovative ways to build capacity around incorporating engagement with Japan into their campus environment. This segment will be led by Mr. Gabriel Rebeck, the Japan Programs Manager at the Laurasian Institution, who will facilitate a conversation with Dr. Christopher Hesselton. He's the Associate Director of Global Partnership and Initiatives, and Nagai Mariko-san, who is Japan Outreach Initiative Coordinator, Global Partnerships and Initiatives at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Again, throughout this, this session, we ask you to drop your questions into the chat as we go through, and we will address them either at the end of each segment or during the, 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 sec, the, the sections of this program that are for Q&A. I will now turn the program over to Dr. Higurashi. Okay, I'm going to show you the slides and I will uh, briefly introduce uh, JSI. Hi everyone, I'm Yoshiko Higurashi of San Diego State University. And here, let's see. Okay. And let's see if, uh, voice. Okay. Okay. And so, uh, uh, first, uh, Dr. Newly Paul will uh, give a presentation, and then 
uh, if the technical difficulties are solved by the time her presentation is over, then Dr. Sandra Gonzalez Domond will give a presentation. She is a professor of psychology. <clears throat> And if the tech, uh, tech, uh, tech problems are not uh, solved, then I, we will wait uh, until Joy's program is over and, and see how her situation is. Okay, and then, okay, um, uh, let's see, ask you, as you know, American Association of State Colleges and Universities, more than 400 member institutions, the size of each institution ranges from 1,000 students to 44,000 students, and ASCU's office is located in Washington, D.C. And then <clears throat> Japan Studies Institute's official title is National Faculty Development Institute, incorporating, <clears throat> excuse me, incorporating Japanese studies into the undergraduate uh, curriculum. This began uh, in late 1980s, and then uh, first Japan-U.S. Friendship Commission's money, funds, and then Sasakawa Foundation, uh, Nippon Foundation donated $1 million. And it's, it runs for two weeks currently, and this year's JSI was the 28th Institute. So it's been going on. Uh, let's see. And then uh, since its inception in 1987, JSI has trained <coughs> approximately 500 faculty members <coughs> and administrators in over 200 institutions, coming from 200 institutions. And <coughs> multiple disciplinary in content. So we cover mainly humanities, but we try to cover as many areas as possible designated for faculty without prior professional training in Japanese studies. And they apply with recommendations uh, made by their home institutions, usually by their deans or president, provost or president. And academic sessions, geography, history, political science, you can see these. And then language, <coughs> excuse me, Japanese language, culture, literature, films, anime, and pop culture. And workshops, tea ceremony, flower arrangement, taiko drum, origami paper folding, brush painting, California roll making, and meditation. So you have a lot, we have a lot of uh, workshops. And then field trips, we will go to a Japanese friendship garden, international minge, that means folklore, folklore art, museum, and Buddhist temple of San Diego, and Cabrillo National Monument. And then Japanese government organizations in Los Angeles are very supportive. So <clears throat> Consul General of Japan and Japan Foundation, actually not only in Los Angeles, but also in New York, they help us. And then Japan External Trading Organization, JETRO, and JNTO, Japan National Tourism Organization. And then uh, keynote address. Uh, we on the on usually on Thursday of the second week, we have all day conference, which is different from the regular program. And then keynote address by an acclaimed scholar. And then presentation how to explore exchange opportunities with universities in Japan. So you will see how we have been developing uh, exchange uh, programs. And, and presentation on JET program by Jody. And JET means Japan Exchange and Teaching. And then a presentation on JOY program, uh, Japan Outreach Initiative from uh, uh, Laurasian uh, Institutes representative like Gabe. Gabriel or uh, Samantha. Okay, next, uh, university's commitment. So SDSU is so excited. So Provost is in charge of have a hosting opening ceremony. The president uh, throws lunch on reception. <clears throat> so SDSU became an official co-sponsor of a JSI beginning with the 2013 Institute. So. Uh, these are some of the pictures from the past JSI. Okay, so everyone is having fun. Flower arrangement. Okay, now I'd like to ask newly Paul, Dr. Paul, to give a presentation 
uh, on her experience and how she is incorporating what she learned into the courses she's teaching right now. Okay, Newly, is you? Yes, thank you, Dr. Higurashi. I'm going to start by um, sharing my presentation and giving you an idea of um, how I plan to incorporate what I learned at GSI. So uh, hello to everyone. My name is Newly Paul, and I'm an assistant professor of journalism at the University of North Texas in Denton. Um, I am just so excited to be a part of this presentation, and I can't wait to tell you everything I learned at uh, the GSI Institute this summer. Um, this was probably one of the most fun and rewarding professional development activities I have done in my career so far. Um, it was way beyond my expectations. Um, I just had so much fun and I learned so much in the two weeks that I was there at SDSU. And um, ever since I've come back from there, I've been telling anyone who cares to hear about how great this program is and why they should apply to it at least once in their professional career. Um, it's just made me, I mean, I'm going to give you some examples in my my, uh, presentation today about how it has helped helped my career, but just uh, from a personal point of view, it's just helped me appreciate Japanese culture so much more. Um, I've always had an interest in Japanese culture, but through this program, it's helped me uh, make that way more concrete. And so, uh, I'm really looking forward to sharing some of my thoughts with you. So, my presentation is uh, basically about how I. Uh, plan to incorporate and, and how I have incorporated some of the things I learned at GSI in my undergrad journalism curriculum here at UNT. So I'm going to be talking today about five main ways in which I have um, incorporated or how I plan to do this in my curriculum. So uh, just overall, uh, to, just to orient you, um, what I thought was more beneficial for my particular um, case was to infuse some of the elements that I learned from GSI into my existing journalism classes. So instead of starting a whole new course that was about Japanese studies or about Japan, I found it way more easier to infuse some of the classes into already existing courses that I have. And the reason for that is because we already have a Japanese studies program here at UNT in the language uh, department. And we also have a study abroad program, which is run by the language department, and another study abroad program, which is run by the journalism department. So for all of those reasons, uh, I thought it was just useful for me to sort of incorporate some of the elements into already existing classes. Um, one of the classes in which I was able to use what I learned at GSI this semester was my mass common society class. So this is a class that is a really large survey class. And by large, I mean, this semester, I had close to 450 students in this class. So it's a really large class uh, by most standards. And um, I, this class basically teaches uh, people from all over the university, uh, students from all over the university are welcome to register. It basically teaches people about the principles and history of MassCom. So we have a whole lot of classes about how journalism started, uh, what's the history of newspapers, magazines, radio, TV, all of those things. We kind of trace it from the beginning to uh, the trends today. Um, I run it in an asynchronous and online manner. And to tell you how I incorporated something specific from GSI, uh, I have this module where we talk specifically about global media. So what I did is I sort of revamped an assignment that I was using in that particular module to make it more Japan centric. So usually in that module, I have an assignment that asks students to look at the Reporters Without Borders ranking of media in various countries. So people, uh, students will go on the website and they will look at how this particular organization has ranked press freedom in various countries. So Japan has actually fallen in ranking from 67 out of 180 countries in 2021 to 71 out of 180 countries in 2022. Um, and this is mainly because of some 
uh, specific restrictions that the government imposed on reporters uh, after the pandemic, specifically saying that, you know, reporters have to talk about certain things in their reporting. They cannot criticize the government overly. They have to only certain number of reporters can uh, can come to press briefings and so on. So I asked students to look up Japan, look at the um, the ranking on the Reporters Without Borders um, website, summarize the findings and compare what they found with US media structure and talk a little bit about why they think these differences are there, how Japan and US media are different in terms of structure, what they publish and so on and so forth. So the students were really excited about this assignment. Usually I have people who will pick countries like um, Saudi Arabia or North Korea because they're so different from the US, but Japan was interesting because they have so many um, similarities in culture, or, or I would say they're they're both developed countries. Um, and so in terms of the press, there are also some similarities in the structure. So it, it was interesting for the students to compare countries which are sort of uh, at par which, with each other. And then another assignment that I had thought of where I got the idea at GSI was to screen a movie like Tokyo Vice, which I, I learned about this movie at JSI. The keynote speaker actually was uh, praising it a lot. And I binge watched this movie as soon as I got, uh, not, not a movie, it was a series. I binge watched it as soon as I got back home from JSI. And it, it's, it's amazing. I can't wait for the next season to come out next year. But my plan is to assign uh, this show to students to watch or even um, have them watch a couple episodes so they can uh, talk about US uh, journalism trends and trends in Japan and how this particular character in the story, uh, in, in the show, how they navigate these trends. So that would be another exciting assignment idea for which came totally from GSI. Another class where uh, I could incorporate some of the elements of JSI is my news reporting and editing class. This is uh, for journalism students. It talks about grammar, journalistic, journalistic style, etc. It's a much smaller class. It's about 20 students and it's open to sophomores and juniors and I offer it face to face as uh, well as online and it's a very hands on class. So um, some ways in which I can incorporate what I learned at GSI is in, in various assignments, I have uh, students where uh, students comparing, you know, uh, media coverage of a certain topic, say, and how it was covered in Japan newspapers and how it was covered in US newspapers and sort of do a comparison of the style, of the context, of the focus, of the framing, those kinds of things, and also look at social media posts and so on. So one example of uh, how I use this in my class this semester is uh, I had a module where we were talking about, you know, how journalists uh, fashion their content to meet audiences' needs, and they kind of uh, frame things differently depending on who is reading a particular thing. So I showed my students an article which was published uh, in English language, but in a Japanese newspaper. And the same event was captured, was covered by the New York Times. Uh, as we know that the New York Times' audience is global, but but primarily they are looking at US audiences. So we were able to compare and contrast the coverage of this particular event from uh, the Japan uh, newspaper's perspective and the New York Times. And the students were able to see how there were very clear differences in how journalists had framed that particular issue uh, depending on who their audience was. So they found that very interesting. Uh, I mean, I could do similar assignments with social media posts and have um, students enhance their research skills when they do an assignment like this. Uh, another class where I thought what I learned at JSI would be very useful would be the race and gender class. Uh, this is again a survey class, which is fairly large. It's about 100 students and it's open to everyone in the university. It's sophomore and up and we have um, we have offered this in the past in online as well as face-to-face -face formats. So this class is interesting because we talk a lot about the uh, how the media represent various racial groups. And um, the textbook for this class usually glosses over Asian representation, or they will sort of clump together all Asians. And as we know that there is a lot of um, differences in this whole racial group that is talked about as Asian. There are many differences there. So uh, one thing I found interesting was you know, I could use some of the resources that I got from GSI to um, enhance the 
offerings in this class and sort of tell students, you know, here are these resources that you can use to learn a little bit more about Japanese uh, American representation in, in US media or even global media. So we got some specific handouts when I was at JSI um, from the librarian, who, which I found was very useful. So one specific resource was from the Stanford uh, website where they had um, these resources that were talking about some specific incidents that had happened in Japanese American history. So those would be some things that I could assign students where they could learn um, more specific in uh, inst instances about uh, Asians in uh, America and they would be able to write about it. So other things that we could do is just do research papers on media representation where people could compare uh, newspaper coverage or even movies and how they depict Asians. You know, there is um, Bridgerton, there is Crazy Rich Asians, all of these movies. Um, they could do some fabulous assignments on those lines. Um, I mentioned earlier that my department offers a, a study abroad program in Japan, and we are currently in the midst of uh, recruiting students for this program. It's a very popular program. We have about 20 spots, and we just started uh, recruiting students, and we've already filled up 12 spots, so only eight um, spots remain, which we are hoping to fill up by December. So um, I, uh, I will be co-leading this particular study abroad program with uh, one of my other colleagues. And this is again uh, open to all uh, journalism and PR majors. We will go for a five week period in the summer of 2023 to Japan. Um, I mean, I feel uniquely um, equipped actually with the with the two week course at uh, in JSI. I mean, it, it was short and I won't call myself an expert in any way, but after attending JSI, I feel uh, way more confident in being a part of the study abroad tour, uh, sorry, study abroad program. And um, in this program, we expose students to media executives in Japan. We give them materials about Japanese culture. We, uh, we will also be, I will also be telling them about the Czech program and so on and so forth. But I'll also be preparing a short handout for them, which will be based on things that I have learned at JSI, which will give our students a little bit of a background that they can refer to and which will help them feel more equipped when we finally um, leave for Japan. And then the last thing that I found very useful for my um, academic career was uh, the whole array of speakers that we had at JSI. Uh, I was really um, influenced by a lot of their um, speaking abilities, their, their presentation techniques, and I learned a lot from them. Um, I, I will spe especially mention our language teacher who had so much patience and she was extremely encouraging. She was trying to teach us um, some rudimentary Japanese in two weeks and she was really patient with us. So as an educator myself, I really learned a lot by listening to those speakers and I was, um, and I'm kind of using some of their style, some of their techniques in my classes. So in all of these ways, um, I found the JSI program very useful for me. And um, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay, Newly, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. So Sandra, how, how is your situation? It's much improved. And thank you so much for um, your, your kind patience and resilience as I negotiated these technical difficulties with the assistance of the IT folks here. I'm deeply grateful for their help and of course, all their assistance. So I'm Dr. Gonzalves Demond. I am a full professor of psychology at Ramapo College of New Jersey and just delighted, truly delighted to be part of this uh, Zoom meeting. I self-define in terms of agency, in terms of being a social personality psychologist and an Africana scholar. Lived epistemological realities and <laughs> narratives continue to guide my worldview. And I have an unwavering commitment as an educator to develop holistically and to enlarge plural narratives, especially since there's a dearth or paucity of the mm -hmm. Japanese or Japanese American experience at my institution. As a community, we are reworking our academic master plan, part of which is internationalizing of our academic uh, curriculum and global footprint. And this is mushrooming into a front burner platform issue in the academy. And I feel the enormity of this moment to infuse Japanese studies. 
So the Japanese Studies Institute provided an erudite and really stellar two-week learning experience. It widened my aperture of experiences in another culture and helped write the next chapter of pedagogic excellence after what for me has been 42 years of college teaching. And also furnished me with the opportunity to thread interconnections with other areas in BIPOC studies, Black, Indigenous, People of Color studies. Prior to being a fellow, I had engaged in the historical literature on World War II Japanese American experience of internment and post internment. However, JSI program was broad and comprehensive, providing an introduction into the following Japanese language, history, geography, architecture, music, tea ceremony, taiko drumming, art, calligraphy, films, floral arrangement, and Japanese meals, which I particularly enjoyed. We're also provided with the opportunity to engage in experiential and outside activities in the San Diego area, such as museums, restaurants, Buddhist temples, and site visits, and then more. Now, specifically, the three courses that I teach that I lend themselves to a much more conscious inclusion of Japanese studies. Courses I teach include multicultural psychology, cross-cultural psychology, and a capstone course in Black psychology. These have been <coughs> all subjected to um, curricula changes. They're all fertile or fecund areas uh, for infusion. But let me sort of drill down more specifically to talk about the ways in which these uh, issues of Japanese studies have been infused specifically per course. So in the multicultural psychology course, I have now instituted a two week um, uh, uh, topical areas, which include the following, the immigration experiences. Um, also, we've talked more specifically about World War II, the internment and post-internment period, and how that connects and interconnects with issues of intergenerational trauma. In addition to that, given the COVID viol um, uh, epidemic, we've also seen a rise or an uptick in anti-Asian violence, discrimination, and xenophobia. So that fits very broadly into the social psychology part. Also, I have uh, brought in a film which is called or entitled Come See the Paradise, and it talks about miscegenation laws and how these um, actually influenced and impacted um, on Japanese well-being and state of mind and connected, of course, to miscegenation laws that, that happened prior to the 1960s Loving versus um, the United States Supreme Court. In the cross-cultural psychology uh, course, I have um, brought in and instituted more discussion on transgenerational trauma. We've also looked at foods um, and students have been very excited by the food concept. Um, two of the musical things that really resonated with me while I was at the Japanese Studies Institute was the issue of taiko drumming and realized <laughs> how challenging taiko drumming is and in fact listened to a lot of taiko drumming while preparing for this presentation and the U2, which was a beautiful instrument, a traditional music uh, instrument that I particularly loved and resonated to given that my daughter plays the cello. Um, as a psychologist, um, trying to infuse issues um, of transcultural psychology or comparative psychology has been very meaningful for me. And two particular therapies um, that have had meaningful connection because they've been ensconced within the Japanese framework are Morito and Nikan. And so we've talked about that and talked about it in relationship to being a culturally centered um, kind of therapeutic modality that has really worked well, well for Japanese American and Japanese in particular. One particular kind of um, issue that has been discussed more frequently as well in terms of mental health issues is the hikikomoros. And so connecting that to the agoraphobics who tend to be more hermits and who tend to live alone in the midst of the COVID virus as well and in terms of sort of the contemporary issues that are brought to bear, especially on people who have high needs for achievement. So that has been very interesting to our students and have been quite enlightening from a cross-cultural perspective while making um, cultural comparisons here as well. I will be teaching once again the capstone course in Black psychology. And for that particular course, what I wanted to do was to try and find the interconnections between the Japanese experience and the African-American experience. And I found that a lot of Japanese Americans were actually quite vocal and quite present in the civil rights struggle. And I had not known about you know, a lot of their connections. So just unearthing that particular kind of interconnection uh, in, with especially the issues of reparation and with sort of the connection also between what we call Pan-Africanism as evidenced by uh, Du Bois, 
um, and Elijah Mohammed, and connecting that to the Pan-Asian experience where people were actually talking the same language. And the language that was quite current at that time is the language which really combined their struggles against colonialism and imperialism. So on that level, they found fertile intersective grounds. So that will be the area in which I kind of infuse the Japanese studies into that particular capstone course. The piece de resistance for me really comes in the fact that I have requested a sabbatical leave to develop a wider broad broadband for topical area coverage. This will be the first ever capstone course, Japanese psychology course taught at our academic institution. I also Googled Japanese psychology and found that there were no academic institutions that were actually offering a singular standalone course in Japanese psychology. So the fact is that this will be quite a very revolutionary and groundbreaking issue to offer that course, hopefully at the end of the, um, the sabbatical leave. Part of that plan um, that I have crafted is a short visit to Japan to get that experiential connection on the ground. And also to maybe just drill down in my knowledge uh, accumulation and knowledge production in the area of pre-Japanese history, more on the immigrant experiences, what they experienced in Hawaii and other places like um, California and Oregon. There's spatial geographic uh, locations, especially in California in the United States. I want to also look at the issue of discrimination and xenophobia, anti-Asian violence, their educational system, and of course, reparation, which is a big issue that finds interconnections with the African-American experience as well. So I will read and I will prepare materials for the course. I will want to interview Japanese scholars and Japanese American psychologists, join the Asian American Psychological Association, go to their conferences, meet and greet and expand my associations, and also to kind of develop much more of an intimate connection with the issue of intergenerational and transgenerational trauma from the Japanese perspective, and also their coping strategies and resilience strategies. So it's going to be a very strength-based kind of discussion. It's gonna be balanced. And in conclusion, I would say that my participation in JSI Japanese Studies Institute provided an inflection moment for me and supported my passionate desire to grow and now effect what I consider to be seismic and transformative uh, curricula changes. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sandra. So Jody, I will uh... Put, uh, return the program back to you. You are in charge of this section, uh, question and answer. Yeah. Right, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so happy that you were able to join us. Thank you both um, for your presentations, um, Dr. New, uh, Dr. Pa and um, Dr. Gonzalez Damond. I had the pleasure of meeting both these yes. wonderful individuals and spending some time with them over during the time that, that, that they were at JSI this summer. And it's always such a pleasure to see the different lenses from which our fellows approach the work while at JSI, but also even to see what they do after they leave the program. And I hope that everyone um, that's on the session today, uh, some of you actually see some JSI alumni in this program. So I know they're probably very curious to see what's happening in JSI, but also to learn about the other opportunities that are available after JSI. And, and neither one of these, um, you don't have to ha have been a JSI alumni to participate in JOI and vice versa. But I think what I want to highlight here between um, Dr. Pauls and Dr. Gonzalez Damon uh, presentation is just how vastly different the work that they are doing is. It still meets the common goal, but their areas and their academic disciplines are so different. And that is one of the, I think the most interesting and rewarding thing. And it's just a little bit selfish that every time I go to JSI, it's like a new JSI every single time because the amazing scholars that come to this program really do approach incorporating or thinking of how to um, to bring international experiences to their students and in so vastly different ways about Japan is just what is always consistently inspiring. If you have any questions as you continue to listen, please share them with us. You can also send us um, questions via email. But 
thank you again both. And I'm going to turn this part of the program because we don't currently have any questions in the chat. I'm going to turn this um, section of the program over to Mr. Rebecca from the, from the Laurasian Institution. Thank you very much, Jody. Okay, yeah, so I guess I'll uh, take it from here to segue into talking about the um, JOY program, the Japan Outreach Initiative, as another sort of um, direction that one could go after their participation in JSI. Um, and so first of all, I will start my screen share here so you can see my presentation. There we are. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank uh, Jody Dixon and also Dr. Higurashi for uh, inviting me to uh, come and, and speak today, along with some representatives of the JOY program. I'm very excited to bring uh, a JOY coordinator and her supervisor with me today. Um, but uh, I also wanted to acknowledge that this sort of uh, partnership between uh, the JOY program and the and uh, ASQ and, and JSI came out of a conversation, as Jody was mentioning earlier, between, uh, between herself and uh, one of my colleagues, Samantha Corpus, in a JET program related function as they were talking about uh, JSI fellows coming out of their experience with JSI um, and on fire for education related to Japan, but just a little bit uncertain about how to apply that directly into their university's curricula or other uh, areas of their, their study, that kind of thing. Um, and so my colleague Samantha said, hey, we have the perfect solution for that. We've got this program that brings education about Japan into communities around the United States called the Japan Outreach Initiative. Um, and that's where this uh, that's where this was born. So uh, so the JOY program is a very good solution for people interested in applying their knowledge that they've gotten out of JSI um, into their their host communities, not just the campus, but uh, beyond that as well. So I'd like to tell you just a little bit about what exactly the JOY program is. Um, and uh, some of the other programs that we at Laurasian Institution have to offer. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'll tell you just a little bit about who we are and then dive in a little bit deeper into what the JOY program is. Um, and then as the sort of uh, the main content of the, uh, the presentation today, as I mentioned earlier, we have a JOY coordinator, one of the program participants dispatched to the United States from Japan. Um, her name is Mariko Nagai. She's going to speak a little bit about what uh, work she's been doing and her experience so far. And we also have um, her supervisor, Dr. Chris Hesselton, who will also uh, provide his uh, perspective on the program as well. Um, and then we can open up for some questions if anybody wants to ask a little bit more about the program itself. Uh, and then if I remember at the end, I'll throw up my, uh, my contact uh, information on the screen once again. Um, so I represent Laurasian Institution. The JOY program is one of our programs. Um, and Laurasian Institution was founded in 1990. Um, and what we do mainly is uh, grassroots level programs of academic exchange, particularly between the United States and Japan. Um, we have been partnering with Japan Foundation for many, many years. Um, I think a lot of people are, are happy to receive grants from Japan Foundation. We have sort of a privileged position. Actually, we are partners directly with Japan Foundation. We've been receiving or we've been helping them um, to facilitate their programs for uh, for over 30 years now. Um, and so that's that's a, a large piece of the work that we do. Um, but we also uh, we, we work directly or we facilitate programs with the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We're also designated with the United States State Department. We are able to issue visas for the program participants that we bring over from Japan. Um, we do we do a lot of work in this sphere. I think at a level that uh, not many other organizations are, are are able to to boast that they do. So I'm very proud of the work that we do, um, particularly supporting the relationship between the United States and Japan, which we hold very important on our side here. Um, the programs that we run. So obviously uh, from year to year, we've got different offerings. Uh, we've been running the Joy program for over 20 years now. Uh, we had a big 20 year anniversary just uh, about a year, year and a half ago, I think it was about a year ago. Um, and so the Japan Outreach Initiative has been running for a very long time. Prior to JOY, we had another program with Japan Foundations, uh, Center for Global Partnership at the time, called JLEX, which did very similar work. So that continued for 10 years prior to JOY. So we've been doing 30 years of this kind of work um, with Japan Foundation. Another one of our Japan Foundation programs is JLEAP. So JOY focuses mainly on Japanese culture. JLEAP focuses on dispatching Japanese nationals around the United States to teach Japanese language. Um, I'll talk just a little bit more about that in a second. We also do the New Perspectives Japan program. That's a high school study travel program. 
If you're familiar with the Tomodachi Initiative, we've done many, many of those programs. Um, the Kakehashi Project is another one you might have heard of. These are, these are all sort of um, high school and university level uh, study travel programs, exchange programs where students come either to the United States, from Japan to the United States to learn about the US or vice versa as well. We also send American students to Japan to learn about Japan. We're equal opportunity. We're all about reciprocity here. That's how the relationship grows. Exchange is a two-way street. Um, as I mentioned earlier, New Perspectives Japan, this is the high school exchange program that we have been running for about um, uh, 30 years now. Uh, we send American high school students over to Japan for two weeks in the summer. Um, they do homestays and they learn about Japan by visiting schools and uh, kind of make those grassroots level friendship uh, relationships uh, that last a lifetime. So I personally had my first homestay in Japan when I was 14 years old. So I'm a product of programs exactly like this. Um, this is the kind of thing that uh, many schools around the country try to do. Many Japanese teachers around the country try to do, but may not necessarily have the resources or, uh, or just availability to run programs like this. Therefore, that's where we come in. These teachers can utilize our services to, uh, to plan the itineraries make all the contingency plans, all that stuff. We've been running these programs for a long time. We're good at uh, dealing with all the troubleshooting that comes along the way. And uh, yeah, our, our students come out of these programs absolutely on fire for passion uh, for Japan. And uh, I, I absolutely love it. I love seeing how the students come out of these programs with, uh, um, like I said, passion, passion for the US-Japan relationship. Um, JLEAP is similar to JOY in that it dispatches Japanese nationals, adults from Japan to the United States uh, for two years, but in this case to teach Japanese language in K through 12 schools. Um, this is a program that's been running for 10 years together with Japan Foundation and uh, sort of with the specific goal of improving Japanese language education around the United States. Um, yeah, uh, but similar. So it's kind of like a sister program to Joy in that it does the language side of things where Joy is more focused on Japanese culture. And that's where I'd like to spend a little bit more time with my presentation here. Um, so as I mentioned, Joy dispatches Japanese nationals to the United States for two years um, to teach about Japan, Japanese culture, um, basically uh, spread awareness and understanding of Japan in regions of the United States with few Japan-related activity, activities or exchange opportunities. So the JOY program 20 years ago started only focusing on the South in the United States. It then expanded to the Midwest and now to the mountain region as well. So we do not currently dispatch JOY program uh, coordinators to the East Coast, uh, mostly New York and that, that area, or the West Coast, California, up to Seattle. Um, particularly because we feel that those areas are already relatively well served with uh, with education about the uh, about uh, Japan, um, and the Joy program aims to bring knowledge of Japan into the middle of the country that doesn't have as many opportunities. I personally was born in Iowa, was raised in Kansas. I studied Japanese in high school when I was in Kansas, and uh, seeing the kind of opportunities and uh, resources available to students in, for example, Los Angeles compared to what we had in my Japanese class in high school, it's night and day. And so that's why uh, the JOY program chooses to focus on these areas of the U United States that don't exactly have as many resources for, uh, for that kind of thing. Um, and so what does a JOY coordinator do? During the two years that they're actually in the United States, what do they actually do? All sorts of stuff. They present Japanese culture to all ages. They can do stuff on university campuses. Um, they're, they're usually dispatched to universities, nonprofit groups, Japan America societies, museums, those kinds of things. They can do their presentations in the host site or outside in the, in the community. We ask them to have a good balance of both. Uh, we like them to actually use the resources of the host site um, to, do their, to do their outreach activities. Um, but we also ask them to become uh, self-sufficient in, the, in their capacities and doing their setting up opportunities for themselves to do outreach outside of the host organization as well. Um, so, like I said, this can extend to all ages. They can do anything from, you know, little kids all the way up to, to adults. Um, supporting economic development initiatives. Sometimes there might be some sort of um, economic development uh, uh, plannings and strategies going on within the state that they can become plugged into and help particularly with the communication between the US side and the Japan side. Sometimes these, uh, these programs have 
support at the state level or, or you know, within the United States, but they just lack the, the capacity to communicate with the Japan side. And so that's where a joy coordinator can help step in and help with the communication. Um, bolstering the work of, uh, of international collaborations. So this can be, um, you know, sister city, sister state relationships, that kind of thing, or, or other kind of relationships, um, or uh, yeah, any, any number of sort of existing relationships. Sometimes, for example, the, the governor of a state will come in and have some sort of particular interest in Japan and try to set up some sort of a program, you know, exchange program between the United States and Japan. And then that governor, governor leaves office and, and somebody else comes in and that relationship kind of goes dormant. Joy coordinators can step in and help bring those things back to life. Um, engaging the local Japanese community. Sometimes there will be uh, Japanese uh, sansei or, or, or beyond families that uh, came to the United States a few generations ago and um, or, or even uh, families that have been brought over to the United States uh, for work in, uh, in, in companies, uh, very often this is automotive companies might be, um, you know, based in Japan, but have factories here in the United States. They come over, uh, and, uh, the joy coordinators can sort of get in touch with these Japanese, Japanese American communities in the U S and sort of bring them together for, for events and programming that benefits not only that sort of Japanese or Japanese American community, but then the community at large as well. Um, and, and these are a lot of sort of high, high, uh, 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 very optimistic views of, of what a, a joy coordinator could possibly do. Um, but uh, even at the sort of grassroots level, what they do is they just meet the needs of the host organization. Whatever that host organization needs to do as far as uh, education for their students or for their, um, for their community, the joy coordinator is tasked with coming in and meeting those goals. Um, all the host organization needs to provide is a supervisor, somebody who can point the joy coordinator in the direction of what they should be doing, provide support, provide uh, contacts with people in the local community, sort of help them get a foothold in the, in the community. Um, an office space, a place where they can actually come to do their work. You can see in the middle, in the middle picture there, you know, they've got a little desk and office space, um, you know, and just provide simple stuff like business cards so they can help, uh, you know, with their networking around the community, um, but then housing. So we do provide a, a subsidy for this, but we do ask that the host site find a place where they can live once they arrive in the United States. This could be a homestay, an apartment, any number of different things. But those are the three main things that we ask the host organization to provide in order to dispatch a joy coordinator to the community. Um, and then we provide all sorts of funding and support from our side, particularly for the coordinator themselves. So monthly living and housing subsidies, a vehicle purchase subsidy so they can actually buy, buy a car when they arrive in the United States and get around a material purchase and outreach activity stipend. So this is for them to spend money on their actual outreach or, or just traveling to and from locations to do the outreach. Um, this is kind of like a grant that uh, it's, it's administered to the joy coordinator, but they decide together with the supervisor how they should spend this money. How can they directly benefit the host organization with uh, spending this money? Um, of course, we, we provide all sorts of training for the coordinators um, fr from simple things like how to give presentations. We also you know, tell them how to buy the car once they arrive in the United States, how to, how to get around once they're here. So we are uh, basically in constant contact with the coordinators while they're in the United States. Mariko, that's right. I'm sure she can maybe mention earlier, she, uh, she contacts us all the time with simple questions that we're very happy to answer and, uh, and provide guidance from our side. Um, and then just the general sort of administrative support for, for the coordinators, for the supervisors, if they ever have any questions about how they should be doing their work or, or simple things about life in the United States as well, we, we're always here to provide, provide them that support. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling about what the JOY program can actually do, but who better to hear about the JOY program from than a JOY coordinator from Japan and her supervisor. So today we do have Mariko Nagai, who's from Fukuoka, Japan and currently based at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, to talk a little bit about the work that she's doing there. And we also have her supervisor, Dr. Christopher Heselton, also with the university, um, to provide a little bit of his perspective on the work that she is doing there and, uh, and how he's able to support her and how she is able to support him and the university and the work that they do. So uh, I believe there'll be some time for, for questions a little bit later, but at this point, I would like to uh, throw it over to Mariko and Chris to talk a little bit about the work that a joy coordinator actually does. 
So everyone, please join me in welcoming Mariko Nagai and Chris Hesselton. Thank you so much, Gabe Sam. I would like to share the screen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mariko Nagai. I'm a Japan Outreach Initiative Coordinator um, hosted at University of Nebraska. And then um, my supervisor is Professor Chris Hesselton. Hello, Chris. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Hesselton. I'm the Associate Director of Global Partnerships and Initiatives here at UNL. And I'm also a Professor of Global Studies uh, in the uh, School of Integrative Global Studies. Um, my background is actually as a historian of China, so I've had a long connection with East Asia. So today I would like to um, talk about what um, do I do at the host site, um, Lincoln, Nebraska. First, I would like to um, explain about my host site. So um, my host site is University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Um, especially, I belong to Office of Global Partnerships Initiatives, where it's the center of the um, any global activities or programs at UNL on campus. And then um, I would like to introduce about the connection relationship with um, Japan and then Nebraska. So um, the government put um, a lot of effort to strengthen the relationship with Japan, so Nebraska and then Japan. Um, as a matter of fact, that the governor rickets uh, to receive the order of the Rising Sun Award for strengthening the Nebraska-Japan relationship uh, relationships. And then when it comes to the pork and then um, eggs, um, Japan is the top uh, key trading partner for Nebraska. And there is a Japan-based um, corporation called Saki Motor Manufacturing. Um, and then other um, business in Lincoln as well. And I mean, Nebraska as well. And not just the business relationship, but also, um, especially I learned after I came to Lincoln, there are a lot of connection culture wise. For example, Omaha, which is one of our, one hour away from Lincoln, um, Omaha is a sister city with Shizuoka, Japan. And then also um, in Nebraska, we do have a long history, over 100 history with the uh, Japan American, Japanese American. And then um, Mrs. Vicky Sakurada Schaeffler, she is the project coordinator of the Japan Japanese whole and then history project at the uh, legacy of the Great Plain Museum. Um, she's preserving the Japanese hole in Nebraska, uh, west part of Nebraska, Gehring. And then there is a Japanese garden at the Lolinsen Garden. And there is the Wadaiko group, Kokyo Taiko, who is led by the former Jet Alumni. And then um, there is the origami artist, um, actively um, Linder, Miss Linder Stephen. And then um, there is a ceramic artist, Jun Kaneko in um, Omaha as well. So I would like to introduce what I do as a JOI on campus. So I do on campus, I do assist hosting international um, visitors. For example, when the Consul General of uh, Japan from Chicago visited, I assisted my uh, department GPI, Global Partnerships Initiative, to host them um, and then make sure like things go smoothly. And then uh, when Mayor visit the Kawasaki Reading Room, which is the center for the Japanese study, I um, helped be as a be in liaison between the two parties. And then also, um, for example, I assist international events on campus. Even I'm not going to be a main coordinator, but for example, if the other different um, department um, is hosting an international event, for example, yesterday, the um, English intensive learning um, 
department hosted the global showcase, which is the international students um, exhibit their own culture. I assist them um, to run the event as well. And then when the um, Japanese group from Japan visited, um, I do help. That's on the left bottom pictures that I assisted that the uh, um, programs. It was two weeks program, but um, I personally assisted the program with the different, uh, by collaborate with the different um, department as well. And then if there is a study abroad affair on campus, I do assist the Japan booth. Uh, what's the experience of life, um, general um, life in um, Japan would look like, like? And then I do also um, visit the classes um, and then introduce about Japanese culture. And then next, I would like to um, talk a little bit about off-campus activity. So each site would be different, but in my case, I would say um, maybe about 30% of, of my activity will be on campus and then 70% will be like off campus. But I would say it depends on the month or <laughs> it depends on the time of the year though. But anyway, off campus, um, I do, um, for example, do the community outreach, which I visit the local community centers. And then again, like a class visit, I introduce about, uh, give a presentation about Japanese cultures. And also if there is a local festival uh, related to culture, like cultural festival, I do, um, for example, exhibit the booths, or um, I organize the volunteers, uh, like a Japanese group, and then um, we perform, for example, the folk dance, one of the folk dance called Soran Bushi or Tanko Bushi, Bon Dance, um, and then such. And then I also have a chance to collaborate with the sister city associations in Omaha, and then um, a company of delegation visit. And then um, not just the holding or assisting the events, but at the same time, I do also um, attend the networking events um, across Nebraska. Yes, so that was the uh, part from me. Um, I will pass it to Chris. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, as I said before, my name is Chris Hesselton. Um, I am Mariko's uh, supervisor here at UNL. And I thought probably what would be most useful is to talk about some of the things that I think are important in terms of the work that is in, uh, required for a supervisor, um, and as well as to give some advice if you are considering to be a supervisor about things you need to consider um, for um, the JOY program to be successful, um, particularly in the long run. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize is if you're interested in applying for this program, one of the things is to have a clear plan and goals at the beginning that you can articulate very clearly to the JOY coordinator that's coming in. Um, this is something that's really important, um, not only for yourself in clarifying what you want to accomplish, but also it makes it very clear for the JOY coordinator about what they uh, should be working towards. Because a lot of the work that, um, you know, at least how it works with me and Mariko is Mariko works very independently. Um, we meet regularly um, every week, but for the most part, she is an independent agent who is going out there and making a lot of the decisions about what should be should be doing. So it's good for her to have a clear idea of what, what needs to be done. Um, another thing to think about is really a lot of the work for the supervisor is only going to be in the first month or two of the program. Um, and that is sort of what I'd like to call like the settlement period or essentially the part of the um, program in which you are settling in a new coordinator. So a lot of this work will um, center around very practical issues about living in the US. So we're talking about accommodations, cars and transportation, uh, making sure that they're informed about medical insurance and health, um, making sure they're informed about safety in the community and what to do in certain situations. Um, probably cars are going to be like the thing that are going to occupy the most time. Uh, they are the biggest headache, um, but um, they, it is an issue that can be solved. Although I will say with the pandemic, it has gotten more difficult. Um, cars are more expensive than they used to be. Um, the other thing though is um, when your a new coordinator arrives, you need to spend a considerable amount of time introducing them to the community. And you know, the more effort you put in at the beginning to introduce your joy co coordinator to the community, the better it, the, the better it'll work out in the long term. 
because as they uh, know the community, they're able to sort of spread out and um, uh, find new, uh, new ways of interacting and engaging with the community. So there's usually like this period of adjustment and adaption in which you're spending your time introducing them to community, your, to the community. You're arranging meetings with key community partners. So this can be, um, you know, uh, particular people in the community. This can also be uh, institutions that you think would be um, uh, interesting partners uh, for various kinds of events or activities. And then of course, there's also the, you need to also spend some time introducing them to the local community in terms of restaurants, clubs, and other things for their personal life so that they you know, maintain their own mental health and have their own life outside of work. Um, that's also very important. Uh, and then lastly, another thing to think about um, you know, as a supervisor is you really need to think about the long-term impact. And that kind of goes back to the very beginning with having clear plans and clear goals, right? You need to sort of really keep an eye towards that long-term impact because joy coordinators are only here for about two years. And so you need to think about you know, uh, two years is actually a very brief period of time when you really come down to think of it. And while a lot of community activities and events are great, you also want to think about how that can have a lasting impact. And one of the ways you can do that is think about uh, in your planning, what are the things that you really want to be formulated and accomplished? Um, events are great. I love them, but they're also ephemeral and they eventually, you know, people will not be there to take them over uh, in many cases when the joy coordinator leaves. Um, Mariko, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so the other thing to think about is just some advice uh, I'd have if you plan on bringing on a joy coordinator is really to play on the strengths of your coordinator as a person. So in the first two months, you really should spend a good amount of time getting to know uh, your coordinator and understanding what are the things that they're very good at. Um, and really that's probably what's going to make it more effective as a program is if you play to the individual strengths of your joy coordinator. Um, Mariko is a, a social butterfly, which is a talent I don't have. Uh, she basically will go up to people and meet them. And so I really let her just handle networking on her own. And she has really um, taken that over and she now knows more people in the community than I know. Um, so, you know, play to that strength and, and use that strength. Uh, the other thing is to try and respect the passions of your joy co coordinator. There may be particular things they are interested in doing. And I think you want to give them advice, but you also want to respect their mission. Um, the way I see our relationship is I am not, supervisor I think is a bit of a strong term. I am sort of her advisor and her host, right? Um, we provide a home for Mariko. Um, we do give her direction. She does help us. But primarily I see her as an independent agent who's really to go, who's, her purpose is to go out into the community uh, and to really um, spread joy into the community itself. Um, the, another thing I would say is focus on the mission of joy. And I, I point this out is I think there is a temptation, uh, particularly if you're talking about a university who, which often has very broad goals, um, is to take a joy coordinator and use them for things that may not necessarily be joy focused. Um, um, you know, helping with front desk, uh, helping with um, um, various other programs. And I tr really have tried very hard to make sure that Mariko is only focused on uh, things that are Japan related, Japan focused, uh, or at the minimum East Asia focused. Um, so I think keeping focused on that mission and the general cultural mission of joy is very important. Um, keeping strong communication with your joy coordinator is also important. Uh, Mariko and I, we meet on, uh, we at a minimum meet weekly. In fact, right after this meeting is our meeting or weekly meeting. Um, and honestly, we, we generally meet more than once a week, um, usually twice a week. We see each other very often. But I mean, having a set and periodized um, you know, a uh, space where you meet one-to-one -one is very important in maintaining communication so that they know that they're on the right mission, uh, that they're focused in the right area, but also that they have time to give feedback, uh, to ask questions. Um, all of these things are really important. Um, another thing is, I think it's important to be inclusive. And what I mean by that is um, including um, joy coordinators in the group, into the community that you have in your work. 
and in your uh, town or your city that you live in. So, you know, a lot of joy coordinators, they come on their own. Uh, they don't know anyone in the community and it's important to make them feel included and a part of a team. I think Mariko is already seen as basically part of the GPI team. Um, uh, I sometimes have to remind people is like, she's not an employee, we're, we're not paying her bills and she shouldn't be watching the front desk or something like that. Um, um, also, but at the same time, I also think it's important to give them their own space, their own um, you know space to find their own place in the community, their own interests. And so you have to find a balancing act between inclusivity and also giving them their own space. Um, and then lastly, is just to let joy shine. And by that, I mean to sort of say that I think it's important to let joy coordinators um, really take the credit and be at the forefront of their activities. Our position is kind of like our positions as I know many of you are faculty. And of course, as a faculty member, it's sometimes you need to let the students shine, right? Let them take the credit. Um, don't be out in the forefront. Let, you know, your joy coordinators really um, uh, be out there and just sit in the background and advise them on how to um, be successful uh, in their mission. Uh, so that's sort of the advice I would have as a supervisor. And I think with that, um, I guess we'll open up to questions, I suppose. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Heseltan and Nagai-san. <laughs> it was very good to hear from you. Uh, no, other people on this call may not know that Whereas I do know Gabriel and Samantha who work at Laurentian Institution and on this particular program, this was my first time um, being able to, I've heard of the amazing work from other campuses of how their joy coordinators work on their campuses, but it's been such a pleasure to actually listen to one of the joy coordinators illustrate um, what she is currently doing on campus and also from a supervisor who is actually working daily with a joy coordinator to give such good advice about how to, to collaborate with not just the Laurentian Institute on this, institution on this program, but also with their coordinator on campus. We do have a question in the chat and I want to say I'm respectful of everybody's time. I'm actually impressed that some of you have stayed with us past the time. And so I want to make sure that the question that's in the chat is answered comprehensively. So I'm going to add a bit to that question if, if you don't mind. So Kumi Alderman um, is, uh, oh, actually, sorry, it's Shigetoshi Eda from the University of Tennessee. Uh, they want to know how joy coordinators are selected. For example, you know, what's the level of English communication? So I'm guessing, um, Gabriel, they are kind of, they're kind of, um, wanting to understand how, what, what's the, the process of selecting a joy um, coordinator. And I, I guess to expand this question, I would ask um, if you could give us some information about the joy application cycle, both on the US side and the Japanese side and how it works together to finally have a joy coordinator finally um, arrive in the US and then, um, you know, dispatched or sent to join um, their supervisors on campus. Uh, yes, Jody. Thank you very much. I'd be more than happy to answer that question. Yeah, that's an important point of this. So, so yeah. First of all, thank you very much, everybody, for listening to our slightly long presentation about the the Joy program. Um, if you want to apply for Joy, go to Laurasian.org. You'll find the Joy program on there. There's also some other places where you can connect with us um, on the screen here. Um, also, myself on LinkedIn. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with me if you want to ask any questions after this presentation. Um, but the selection process would begin with, so on the United States side, the host organization side, you would go to Laurasian.org. You'll find the joy page on there and, uh, and you'll find the application to become a joy host site. Um, and on that application, we do ask quite a few questions about how would you utilize a joy coordinator? What are your needs? Um, information about the community. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty involved, um, it's an involved application. Um, you could think of it almost as if it's a, a, a grant application in the, uh, the level of sort of detail that we're asking about as far as, because that's essentially what it is. It's, a, it's an investment of, of um, well, Japanese taxpayer money into sending a joy coordinator to your host organization. Um, so you would submit that application to us that has a lot of details about the community, the needs of the organization, um, the, the sort of plans that you have. One, one year, two year, how you think the joy coordinator could set up um, sustainable activities at the campus or, or host organization. 
so that we can get an idea of what it is that the organization needs. Um, at that point, then um, we would look at the application and eventually would get to the point where we, so first we start communicating with you, the applicant, um, for a representative of the host organization. Um, and then we would schedule a, a, uh, a site recruit visit where we would come out and actually see the campus. So, so some of the, uh, the Laurasian Institution staff, as well as Japan Foundation staff would come to your organization and sort of check it out, speak with you, speak with other administrators, and, uh, and again, get an idea of what exactly the organization needs. Um, we would then take that information and conduct interviews with potential JOI coordinators on the Japan side. Um, we ask for the applications for host organizations to come in by the end of January. Um, and then we do the JOI coordinator interviews in Japan in February. Um, and then we make our final decisions about both the JOI coordinators and the host sites that we're gonna accept for that cohort year at the same time. It's not so much a process of this is a good site, we select them because they are a good site, but more so a process of matching between the coordinator and the site. Um, we're very proud of the matching, the job that we do as far as sort of choosing coordinators that we think are going to be successful at your host organization. Um, sometimes uh, sometimes we, we do uh, a really great job of selecting coordinators for sites. Sometimes there might be little rough patches, um, but we do actually take, uh, we take the, the selection process very seriously and more, more specifically that matching process very seriously. Um, so again, on the coordinator side, it's not so much about um, exactly what is it that they have that we need them to have to become a JOI coordinator, but more so what is it that we need them to match you know, the sites that we have that year in order to have a successful pairing. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things that we look for regardless on both sides. So a little bit of um, infrastructure and you know, making sure that the host organization is going to have the resources needed to host the JOI coordinator. Um, but you know, we, we do have JOI coordinators dispatched to locations that already have many Japanese faculty, Japanese speaking faculty, and, and other resources on campus. We also have JOI host sites that have absolutely nothing. Maybe they are the only Japanese person in that town or, or even you know, larger than that. Um, e either way is fine on the side of the host organization as long as we've had uh, conversations with the, the potential supervisor and we feel that they have the resources to successfully host a JOI coordinator. On the coordinator side, it's more so about skills such as um, flexibility, resilience, um, initiative, things like that. Some of those things that are a little bit harder to quantify um, the things that we try to sort of suss out from them in the interviews that we have. We don't, for example, have like a TOEIC or TOEFL score, a minimum requirement for English communication uh, skills. Um, we more so have the conversations with them and try to figure out, do they have the communication skills that they would need to get along in the host community? Um, like I said, probably the most important things that we look for are those things like flexibility, um, capacity to live and work in a foreign country and, and you know, be okay. Um, we do usually look for them to have some sort of Japanese cultural skill that they are able to utilize and share in the host community once they arrive in the United States. Um, that could range from anything from, you know, knowledge of tea ceremony or, or maybe a musical instrument or, or uh, it could be anything. Um, if they don't have anything like that, we're a little bit more hesitant to, uh, to dispatch them. Um, but uh, we do uh, we do look for them to have some sort of a uh, a, a skill or, or knowledge base that they can utilize in the host community, and again pair that specifically with a community that may be looking for that thing. So again, like if if a if a community has, for example, a tea like a good tea room um, on the university that was donated twenty or thirty years ago, and nobody's been using it ever since then, that kind of thing, we would find a joyous coordinator, a potential coordinator who might have the skill to actually utilize that tea room by doing tea ceremonies in it, or you know, it just a, as an example, right? So it's, it's definitely more so a, a matching process than a specific set of criteria on either side. I, I know that's kind of a long, long answer, but that is, that's, how the, that's how the process works. And I hope that basically answers the question. Yeah. And, and I'll just add to that. I mean, in, in terms of English language uh, levels, I mean, Mariko has not really had any issue there. Um, and I feel like we were very well partnered with Mariko. I feel like we got very lucky. Um, and I'll also say I used to do a very similar program that Gabe has done, uh, and I actually did work very similar to Gabe, uh, and I will say that um, Joy works like clockwork. Um, we've never really had an issue, um, and they're very organized and very professional. So, 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you, you both. You said that almost as if it didn't appear as if I asked you to say that, did it? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just say because I, I, I empathize with you because I've been on your side of the thing, so I know what's going on. And also, um, like, if I can add shortly that, uh, for example, the other coordinator who is dispatched in the different um, states, for example, in Tennessee, there's who can, like, play the color instrument. Um, the other are really good at dancing, but I honestly didn't have any particular one that I was good at when it comes to really um, traditional Japanese cultures, but I always keep it in mind how can, um, how to say, organize the event, and then um, it's not just me sometimes, like how can I collaborate with the others, that's how I always think about it, and it depends on the needs by the, uh, how to say, the place that you visit, um, yep. And, and I think that's that speaks exactly to what I was mentioning about how we don't have a specific set of criteria that they must have, because again yeah maybe maybe Mariko did not specifically have a, a one piece of Japanese culture that she came in saying I really want to teach everybody about calligraphy or whatever, but we saw as as Chris mentioned the social butterfly aspect of her and thought ah. She's going to be able to put people in touch with each other. She's going to be able to give effective presentations. She'll definitely be able to represent Japan and teach very well about Japanese culture in any host community. Um, Jody, I, I might mention I did get one other uh, question as a direct message. Can I can I maybe just address this very quickly? Yes. I, I'm very sorry. I know we're I know we're pressed for time, but this is an interesting question. I did get a question about. Um, the areas in which uh, so, so I mentioned earlier that we only take applications from the mountain, the mountain region, Midwest region, and the South, and we don't dispatch joy coordinators to the coasts right now because the joys, uh, the joy program mission is to dispatch coordinators to areas of the United States with less opportunities for education about Japan. Um, and the question asked about uh, a host community within, in this example, California, that's actually very far away from the larger cities, very far away from the resources. Um, about Japan that I was talking about earlier, and it's still technically underserved in that regard. Um, unfortunately, at this, at this time, Japan Foundation makes its requirements for potential host sites based on location. And we at Laurasian Institution have been having a conversation with Japan Foundation for many years now, several years, I should say, about how to define areas of the United States with less access to education about Japan. Um, we do feel that uh, underserved communities like that in areas such as, you know, rural California, or for example, um, if you're in rural Pennsylvania, if you're outside of Pittsburgh and you're miles away from any location that does actually have those resources, we recognize that those areas are underserved and we're looking to sort of redefine the, uh, the underserved, how we define underserved in order to bring joy to regions like that. But at the moment, we are unable to dispatch anybody to, to the coasts. So if you are interested in helping us to make it possible to change that sort of definition, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I, can't, I can't guarantee that we're gonna be able to dispatch anybody to you in the, in the near future, but uh, hearing from folks like you make it possible for us to help Japan Foundation to redefine how we choose those host sites. Thank you. Sorry, Jody, I know we're running way over. No problem at all, Gabriel. I'm so thankful for everybody. I wanted to make sure I spotlighted everybody so I could tell you all how thankful I am for being present and staying with us. Um, thank you to the people, especially on the call, who stuck with us, <laughs> um, even though we've gone over time. But I know that uh, based on some of the names in the in the in the participants list, that you are some of the individuals who are very committed to this type of work, particularly with Japan. And so, hopefully, the information that was shared here today will prove quite useful to you. These are resources that you can tap into at any time. Uh, you can contact Gabriel, um, you can contact myself, uh, Professor Higurashi, um, and you know, send us any questions that you might have. We'll be sharing this recording. So if you have any colleagues that you think uh, that you might be able to submit a proposal with um, that would that you can that you can easily share this information with, we're more than happy um, to provide this recording so you can share it across your campus. Um, and I can definitely vouch for the JOY program and definitely for JSI because, you know, I, we live, breathe, and eat JSI <laughs> at certain times of the year. Um, but I wanted to say thank you all again. And thank you for joining us for the final session of the International ASCUS International Education Week. Thank you so much for your continued commitment to serving your students and your communities. Um, and I look forward again, look forward to joining you for future sessions. 
Um, and to see you again next, next year on International Education Week. We possibly could feature one of your institutions if you are doing work in any of the thematic areas that we'll focus on. And as always, thank you for supporting ASCU's international programs. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Should I?